So great to be here, great to be with you for such a wonderful international crowd um, thinking about and preparing for a reconstruct the future of, of our world, so to say. I hope so. Uh, for me, as I'm doing international work on the commons, I've been living in El Salvador for quite a while. I've been working in Cuba for quite a while. I've been living in Mexico City. And now I'm traveling all over um, the continent to try to make sense of something we can find literally um, throughout history, throughout culture, in every place of the earth. So my, the first question I have for you to answer is, what, how do you call commons in your language? Take a paper. Oh yeah, please take a paper and not your laptops because I would like, if there is something new you can come up with, I would like to, to give you to give it to me. So what's, well how do you call commons in your language? Make up your minds. And um, that's just, just, a word. just a word. Yeah, I'm just talking about the word. And that, I mean, that's a good question. Is it just one word, or is it two or three or four or five? Where do you come from? Oh, I guess you will find 15. <laughs> no, it should not. It, whatever, whatever you come up with, whatever you think we are talking about. Here was a good question in the front. Just one word? No, it might be one, two, three, four, five, fifteen. And be prepared, I'll ask the very same question at the end of the course as well. Keep, wow, that's super. Yeah, write it in your language, please. Uh, that's very good. No, I'll, I'll give you the chance to write more, and you give it to me after the course, right? Yeah. So if you write it in your language, which is not Cyrillic or Latin letters, please give it to me in Cyrillic letters, uh, in Latin letters, sorry. I can read Cyrillic letters, even Japanese, but not this one. <laughs> OK. Are you done? OK, so keep that sheet completed throughout the afternoon. Add it, add whatever you want to wish to add, and then give it to me at the end, because this is great stuff for me to work on in the future. So what is the comments, then? A few answers in your language. Comunes. Comunes in Spanish. Great. You? Samuri. Samuri. In? Samuri. In Hindi. In Hindi. Samurik. Okay. What do you have there? Almen in Turkish. Okay. Almende. Are you German or Swiss? Swiss. German. German. Almende. Okay. Uh, who else? That's so interesting. I've never heard this. I, I need to. I need to. I need to get this one. <laughs> okay. So we we'll in, in, in Russian. Yes. What about Obshina in Russian? So I'll write down the other one as well. Okay. Great. Wonderful. So uh, this is something, so you, I feel kind of very inspired. I will take this into our next book, that's for sure. But I want you to have a look at this word. Listen to the, the talk or the, the work we'll do together. It won't be a talk, it will be more kind of a conversation. And kind of try to compare if what you have on the paper comes close to what we will talk about. Or if you come up with new ideas, like if there is just one word on the commons in your language, or if there are actually two, three, four, five, or 15 different concepts, or social practices, that is, concrete realities on the ground, OK? Uh, so where do we start with? What is the commons? 
I guess you are studying economics, right? Basically, most of you. So you, <laughs> we're trying. you're trying to, yeah. <laughs> so I guess you're very familiar with that one. Right, the rivalry and excludability thing. Okay. We just so we put a plus and plus here and a minus and minus there. And we can just repeat that one quickly. What do classic or neoclassic economists put into these how's it called quadrants? If something, they base their definition on what? Excludable yeah? Sorry. But what, should, what is supposed to be excludable and rival? It's private. The goods, yeah, exactly. So this is private. This one? Uh, non excludable and rival. Uh, it's a common good. Exactly. Common? About I need to put good here. It's yeah. not a common, it's common. just a good. This one? Yep. Yeah. And the other one is public, public right? Yeah. So let's take water. Where do we put water into? It's a common good. In Italy it is a common good. Uh -huh. <laughs> and this one? <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. So you are a very advanced course. And that means basically, and this is my first kind of summary of this one, is that still the very classical definitions on the commons in scientific literature, it's very much based on this one. So there is a kind of presupposition that there are certain types of goods which have an inherent quality to be converted into a commons, right? And so what we basically are saying in the work we are doing is there is no such thing as a, or a, a definition or an approach to the commons based on a cer certain type of goods does not make very much sense. So I've, I guess you have, that's nothing new to you. But it's very challenging for conventional scholars to kind of really, I mean, everybody says, okay, we are clear that water can move from here to there, it can move from here to there, it can move from here to there. It's very clear to people and easy to understand that it's not about the good itself, but about what we make out of it. And still, you will find this as a very basis on the way we conceptualize commons, especially in economic literature. So how do we get out of this? How do we really get kind of detached from that very um, good theory? Then we, we started, we moved to another one, from the quadrant to the triangle. Sorry? No, we just said that is something we very we, we use very often in our well in our writings to say, okay, if it is true that you cannot base the definition on the commons, on the theory of goods, so where do you anchor it then? How do you uh, make sense out of it? Because it's also true that if it's based on social relationships, these social relationships rely to something. Like um, if I make a commons out of water, like a commonly managed source of water, I still rely, I still have a relationship with that source of water. It's still about my relationship to nature, right? So we said, okay, we can try to, we can try to, um, show this in a triangle and say, here are the resources. But there are all kinds of resources. There's no reason to say that only a certain type of resources, like water, 
can be converted into a commons. Also knowledge or things that are non-rival and non-excludable can be converted into a commons. If it's true that it all depends on us and how we relate to each other, there's no, no reason to say that the commons framework only applies to a certain type of goods. Okay? So we say, okay, here are resources which can be both water and knowledge. And there are the subjects, the communities, but as we are living in a kind of ongoing developing world, these can also be networks. Or as my colleague David will certainly say, uh, Michelle, next week will certainly call them peers. So people who rely on those resources because they want to make something out of it through, and this is the third element, certain rules and norms based on a certain infrastructure, etc. So basically the idea is like there are people, peers, that rely on the resources through rules and norms and something comes out of it, which is twofold. Commons as a product. So in essence here we have a concept of the commons which is kind of comparable to a commodity in, capitalist, in a capitalist society. Right? So you produce something like uh, something you can eat or drink or put on your as clothes or, uh, and so on and so forth, but you have a second layer of production, so to say, which is spaces of commonality. Or in other words, you deepen relationships. So a common scene this way is always a process of producing two things products and things we can use or make use of and I'm talking about literally everything you can you can think about a car building a car as a commons co-producing a car as a commons and you can think about co-producing and stewarding water as a commons of course so it's not only about these natural resources or the management of knowledge thing it's about a long the whole line of, how would they say um, today, of value production. You can really kind of think about producing literally everything as a commons. And this is a process we call commoning. <coughs> so once you get to this idea that actually the commons is a social relationship mediated through your real special way to relate to things that don't belong to only one person in a certain set of self-determined ru determined rules and norms you immediately realize that we are not talking about things or goods but about the social process okay I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure if that's the way you were talking about the comments here. I've heard um, Benjamin Coria's talk on the comments, which was slightly different, but kind of everything is clear about this social relationship thing. So once you come up with that idea, that's basically about a social relationship in relation to resources we use and that don't belong to only one person, then the question is, if this question is a good one, or if it shouldn't be like that. How many of you study something of philosophy or so, okay, so if you ask like this, philosophically speaking, what are you asking for? Breaking 
possible? If it could exist or not, exactly. You ask about an existence. And you imply, basically, that you ask about a substance. In German, sein, das sein. Does it exist or not? It depends. It depends of if you talk based on a substance ontology or processual, processual ontology, right? Exactly. So, but just to make that point, you look like very skeptical. <laughs> Any comment? <laughs> I'm not skeptical. I'm, I'm, I'll ask you some questions afterwards. Okay, great. So, um, so. If we would slightly change the question and take that issue seriously, that comments is a process of commenting, so we could simply ask not for a definition of the comments, because that asking for a definition of the comments is kind of the way natural scientists do. They need a precise definition of something which is needs like a mathematical clarity of what it is and what it's not. And this is very hard to do in social sciences. It would be way better to, uh, to, to ask, for instance, you put that word down, mm -hmm. and I would need to ask you, what does it actually mean for you in this specific context, right? So then we can start to have a conversation of what you mean by comments and what I mean by comments and how to find common ground. So how could we slightly change the question and say, how, and this is the important thing to do politically, how is the commons becoming? Or in other words, to me or to us, working from this social activist perspective, the commons is a process and not a substance and not a thing and not a certain type of resource nor a certain type of property regime with two outcomes, so to say. First, it goes right through us. It makes us being different as the interaction, the social interaction in the commons is different than the social interaction in the market. So it's a process of becoming both ways, of becoming a commoner that is, to change our subjectivity, so to say, and of co-producing commons. That is, producing a house as a commons, steward, stewarding a meadow as a commons, producing a car as a commons, etc. So it's always twofold. It's co-producing subjectivity and it's co-producing things we need to use and to reproduce our livelihoods. Okay. That's in Germany, we would say, does this sound like Chinese to you? <laughs> because this was kind of the first part, because I was asked to give a definition on the commons. So the first thing is, I can only say that this is my approach to the commons, my understanding of the commons, which is very differently different from giving a definition and say, hey, we know what it is, right? And that, that, that has to do with an attitude. So if we talk about the commons, we cannot do it as, as, we, as if we were mathematicians, so to say. So this is the first part. I'll have three uh, inputs, and I open the floor for the first questions. Then. Yeah, if there are. Ah, you have a bit different structure. No, no, but I, I think we can also have questions starting from the questions. Yeah, and just then anyway, anyway, they, you you will have then the discussion uh, as a whole. Yeah. But maybe some questions. Yeah, questions if there is something you say, okay, here, I'm puzzled with what you've just said. Uh, if not, we can go on. Do you have an example? Do I have an example that, that, of that, that is not uh, I mean, the usual one? <laughs> okay. 
Go, okay, we take that later. I was I was asking for questions on this part of it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I was going to ask just an example of what the usual comments would be. Because for like a third of us, we've studied comments quite a bit, and the two thirds of us really haven't at all. So ah, okay. sort of what, like when you say comments, um, for some of us, there's not really anything there as far as like there's not like an economics, like we're thinking of lakes or streams or um, grazing pastures or something like that. that then, then, then like the archetypical comments, like we don't have that. Oh, well, I, I guess that was the first thing I, I, I was trying to explain. I, I could not say a lake is a commons yeah. or a water is a commons, right? I would need to qualify it and describe how this is produced and what for it is produced. If I don't make that additional explanation, it doesn't make sense simply. It doesn't make sense to, for me today. I've written like this, water is a commons five, six, seven years ago, well, I've changed opinion. It doesn't make sense for me to say water is a commons. Because let's take, oh, oh now, now we have a complication because um, there are some very general ideas on the commons which are usually explained to people like water is a commons, the air is a commons, etc. And then that Gary Tardin said that um, commons have are open access, and so they might uh, go down and 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 be distracted, etc. And I said that all this you have talked about it, and you know that there is no such thing as a easily as an open access commons. Is that okay? Is is everybody familiar with that? Okay, so I wanted to leave this out, right? So, but let let me take that point of um, the atmosphere, for instance. So basically, in the case of the atmosphere and making use of clean air or the capacity of absor absorption of CO2, what we currently do as humanity is basically using it as an open access resource and everybody tries to put as much CO2 in the air as he can. And now the states, the nation states, come to negotiate, but on a market-based framework on how to put end of this, on this. So basically what's happening there is that every try to reduce um, the quantity of CO2 we put in the air, we blow in the air, is a try to convert an open access resource into a commons. So now the very question is, what kind of mechanisms and instruments are we using to do so? On which kind of frameworks these instruments are based upon? This is the very question. And the second question is, who is doing the negotiation? Qui bono? And who benefits from? So um, basically what I wanted to say is, you cannot say the atmosphere is a common but you can say we urgently need to convert the atmosphere into a commons. And once you have said this, you can ask, OK, how we do that? Which framework, instrumental framework and categorical framework do we use to do that? And first of all, who makes the decision? It's all about who controls, right? So that, that, I guess that's basically my, my message. It's not a thing. It's not a substance, it's not a resource, it's not a given. It's not one end for every time. It's something, it's an ongoing struggle for commoning. And that is an ongoing struggle for, as Elina Ostrom said, the very idea that those who need to rely on that resource have the capacity to also make the decisions. So his politically a very important message. We cannot delegate the commons to anybody. So we cannot delegate it to our governments, for instance. It's not easy to do that. Uh, it's easy about that sort of thing. It's easy to do that. But it's not what we ought to do. Okay?
relationships. Mm -hmm. I don't find that Kabila, like Kabila is saying, oh, <laughs> great, commons are a good alternative. Oh, great, commons are a good alternative, let's do it. So, what I'm, I mean, mm -hmm. it's a nice way of thinking of, of a different society, of trying to like concretize an utopia, mm -hmm. but the, the way in which we get from what, where we mm -hmm. are now till the commons, I think that's maybe the challenge, and I don't completely see how the, the ones supporting this approach deal with this like, uh, way. Uh, so you are asking, I, I, I guess that's a very important thing to discuss, it's a transition question. Right. Perhaps we could, I, I guess many of you are worried about this, especially we have discussed it just outside in the current context. And I would like to have this discussion a little bit after the whole presentation because for perhaps one thing first. I, I would certainly not ask to anybody working in the other framework to switch to that one. I would encourage young generations and people who already do commoning, which by the way, is a pretty huge part of humankind, um, to, to kind of realize that that is the on the ground revolution that's constantly going on. And the more people, and if we are able, if we show that we are able to, I repeat that sentence, convert literally everything into the commons, what happens is that mm, you don't need the other provisioning system anymore, to put it bluntly. If I don't need a car because I organize transportation in my life in such a way that, can, that I can rely on transport commons, I don't need anybody to produce a car for me and to sell it to me. And the best thing of it is I don't need to go to work, labor, uh, and get money, earn money to then spend it on a car. So the, the, the idea, we don't need to convince everybody to switch to another framework. We only need basically there's a tipping point of 15% to do it differently. And doing it differently changes the conditions for the other people to do their stuff. So you mean like forcing other people to turn because others have turned? So reaching the tipping point? No, encouraging the people who want to do commoning to do it and to realize and to realize that that's a perfect way of have a good life in modern society, less dependent on the market, less dependent on money, and you don't need to convince 50% of the population because we don't live in a, this is not a representative system. You cannot represent others, nor then submit the minority, the 49% to your 51%. Just. Uh, Okay. I have, I have a question. You're starting to have a discussion really on the transition. Do we do we put it this, this because transition? First, uh, first, first uh, thing. I'm Very sorry. I'm really sorry. But yeah. You just Go. you just said representative system. We are into a representative system. Sorry. We are into a representative system. Yeah. We represent means we have representatives. Yeah. Because we knew that uh, we didn't we, we knew nothing, but. Uh, uh, this was the idea that somebody could make decisions for us, so that we don't, we all don't have to make decisions, but because it will create a ca uh, chaos. We want all we want to do in this system. It is full of entropy, and we want to make some sense of the system, and that's why we want some s certainty. That was my point for uh, the question of representation. And another point is that when you were saying only 15 percent, the point is that we all want to feel a special. Any time when we will have an option to be a special, we, we will want to be a special, we will want to feel, feel a special, right? So even if when you, when you have a transport system and everybody is using it, there will be people who, will, who would like to feel a special. Means I can drive, if I have an opportunity to drive a Lamborghini, I will drive a Lamborghini. I will not use Metro. I'm using Metro because I don't have an option to drive Lamborghini. So this is... Uh, Okay, okay, I'll keep, we'll keep that for the discussion. That's okay. all very, very, very good. I, I didn't know that you are right into the political debate. I mean, that, that is amazing. But I, I, was, I was asked to give a talk to an economy, economy master class or something. No, great. Okay. <laughs> we'll do that. Uh, um, entropy, representativity, and individuality, right?
So my general response at this point is, please switch the framework. Or to put it other way around, switch the paradigm. Stop talking about entropy, but about syntropy. Stop, stop talking about representativity, but about self-organization. Stop using the word individuality as if it was opposed to commonality. It's not. Okay, so that's what we will hopefully discuss then in the last part. Well, okay, now I got a sense of where we are at. So I'll move, move on. Ah, yeah. Just uh, make sure you know there's, there's three different courses here. So there's ah. one course that ha it does finan or in innovation and knowledge things that's covered the commons. One, one course that does... There is a option. <laughs> yeah. Robert knows about what you're talking about. Like everything yeah. that you're talking about, we know. And we can discuss very deeply. And then there's a third of us who do finance things, which haven't been directly introduced to any of this. And then another chunk that does develop. Great. So. Yeah, I was told that. But now just, just let, let's make sure a rule here. If one of the three parts gets lost because we are discuss discussing concepts you are not familiar with, make this. Just, just make, make me a sign or something. Because this is a, a discussion I would like to have, but I guess you are in the same course. Is this possible? Uh, no. No. Okay. So, but if, if, one, if, one, of the, if one part of the, the group <laughs> gets lost, you just make something, okay? Let's move on with part two then. I feel like a teacher here. That's not that. That's less strange. <laughs> okay. So here's the second idea. Also very, very, very simple. And I've got to come up with um, in our new book with, with a pretty innovative way of naming the subchapters of the book. Because you might be familiar with <laughs> with a categorization like the natural commons or the knowledge commons or the digital commons, right? Does this sound familiar to you? Does this sound familiar to you as well? Okay. So it's that, that very idea, so to say, that if we build the commons around a water supply resource, for instance, source, water source, a well. That is something very different than building a commons around knowledge or software code, which in the nitty gritty, in the reality, it's true. It requires different rules, different institutions, diff perhaps not different norms, but it requires a different organization and a different way of doing, and a different set of limits, for instance. But on the other hand, if I say that commons is a social process that can reproduce what we need to make a living and reproduce commonality, is there any good reason to say one thing is natural commons and one thing is a knowledge commons? And what would a natural commons like the forest commons in India or the water commons all over the world, especially in dry areas? Aren't they, in essence, more related on knowledge than on the water supply itself? That is, the very thing of building a commons is knowing how to do it. You need to know a lot about the water cycle, where it goes, where it comes from, what it contains, what happens with, with drainage and, and getting the water off the ground again, etc., etc. You need to know, to know a lot about social organizing to build whatever commons in the world. Let's take another example. Is Wikipedia, that's one of the classic examples, right? I guess, well, okay, then let me say. Let me say Wikipedia as a classic example. Is Wikipedia knowledge commons? Is it a digital commons? You would, you would find in the literature, yes. It's a classical commons for, framed as a knowledge commons or digital. But is it? I mean, is it? 
how do we get the energy supply for Wikipedia? How do we feed the people who write on Wikipedia? How do we actually, actually, actually reproduce a knowledge commons? Well, we do it based on natural resources. There's no other way. So the first thing we are trying to kind of open your minds on the classical literature, also scientific literature on commons, to say there is no such thing as a natural commons. And there is no such thing as a knowledge commons. And there is no such thing as a social commons. What would a social commons be like? I just learned of one at our lunch. Yeah. There, there was kind of a student initiative to get the free seats for students in the theater or something. Yeah. That's a social commons. Or, or, or that's what people call a social I commons. About the service in yeah, that's a social Where commons. Or in Naples, or in, in many cities of Italy, you have that. You may have seen that. You go to a coffee bar, and there, in some coffee bars, you have kind of a, a coffee for free for poor people. So you can pay a second coffee for somebody who needs it and cannot pay for it. This is social, social commons. Whatever celebration, like carnival, this is obviously a social commons. But is, does it make sense to talk about the social commons, the knowledge commons, and the natural commons as a separated category? So we think it isn't. So we invented kind of new categories, kind of biocultural commons and stuff, saying basically that each commons is based on natural resources. You cannot think about Wikipedia without energy supply, which is based on natural resources. Each commons is knowledge-based. The most important asset, the most important thing you need to build a commons is knowing how to common, is skilling you in commoning, is knowing the nitty-gritty of how a certain resource reacts to a certain incentive or a certain um, action. And third, and obviously, it basically is a, how to say this, ein weißer Schimmel. Um, what's the Deutschen here? A tautology, thanks. Ein weißer Schimmel. It's basically a, a tautology to say each commons is a, a, a commons is a social commons. Because that's already implied in the word. Each commons is a social commons. You cannot think about commas if you don't think about our social relationships. OK, so that was part two. So once we have said this, that, that the, cat, the classic category of natural commons, knowledge commons, digital commons, or social commons, I am sure Michelle next week will talk about the digital commons as if there was a clear distinction from the natural commons, so you can challenge my colleague then next week, <laughs> is said this. We need to be clear that each commons is one of a kind. So just as we said that there is no single definition of the commons, you cannot think about the commons as detached from their context. Context in terms of resource-based, context in terms of knowledge-based, context in terms of social relations, and context in terms of political relations, economic, etc. relations. So each commons is one of the kind. It does not make sense to talk about the commons as detached from their context. What does it mean? Oh, OK. So I have 15 more, right? Ah, super. Oh, yeah, I'll be quicker. Super. OK, I'll be quicker, I think. So each commons is one of a kind. But what we say, and why it must makes nevertheless sense to talk about the commons or a commons as a framework, because we think that there are kind of common patterns in each of them. Or in other words, um, Wikipedia is very similar to a community managed well in South Africa. And this is kind of, what? If this is true, what does it politically mean that we are really the 99%? But that's, again, a political discussion we'll have later. So if it's true 
that kind of co there are common patterns between the way people manage commonly used natural resources wherever in the world and the way the new networks in the digital world are set up and revolutionize knowledge production, then we are really the 99%. So that, that's the good news. And we need a language to talk about this and we need a framework to talk about this. And now I come to that framework, kind of trying to challenge this framework. Mm. I won't do it in a very systematical way because I was more prepared to talk about mm, something you'll find in the political literature on the commons, which is usually a capitalocentric framework. This is a term coined by K. Gibson Graham in the 90s and well many many people also of those we have published and this kind of post-marxist analytic approach is very important to to the commons literature but if we wonder what is specific to capitalism we would come up probably at least those who have studied marx with the answer that capitalism is able to convert everything, literally everything, nanoparticles, genes, labor, ourselves, our bodies, into a commodity. So the, ma the, the danger of putting everything into a capitalocentric framework is that in a certain way you stick to that productivistic framework and try to find kind of the opposite of it. So instead of producing commons, and if you have read my text, it's right in this text, the text that was given to you in preparation of that session. I, I say the very same thing. Well, instead of using commodities, you now need to uh, produce commons, right? Uh, producing commodities, you now need to produce commons. Which is good, which is correct but it's only halfway. It's not where the heart of the common speech, so to say. Um, so in terms of a capital capitalocentric framework, you switch as a social form of production, the outcome, the product, from commodity to the commons. But many people who are discussing the commons within the capital capitalistic framework still talk about labor, they talk about value production, they let me let me put it that way. Um, in capitalism, labor is converted into a commons. And the very problem, especially we have in Germany, we don't even have a word to distinguish labor from work. We use the same word. We say Arbeit, as if it was the same thing to sell y the work you do on the market or just work because you like doing it or because you need to feed your children. So if we want to switch it to another framework, we need to reimagine work in its four dimensions, what are the four dimensions of work in terms of what for? It's even more. Uh, let's say the four principal dimensions. Uh, the the why, why, why are we working thing? The what for are we working thing? Sorry? Self-realization, Self yeah. <laughs> exactly. Subsistence, that's what I would put it in, yeah, and exactly. And um, earning money. Huh? Ah, reward. Reward, uh, which uh, today would be getting money, getting something back. Uh, how do we call it? 
earning a livelihood. Do we put it earning a livelihood? Yeah. I don't care for the words. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. Earning something. Is that different from subsistence? Yeah, it, yeah. That's, why, that's what I'm saying. Let's not discuss the concepts here. It's, uh, it's not I just want to say that um, there are very different works that need to be done. It's not just labor. Labor is usually only a denominator for this part and completely leaves out the other dimensions, right? So if you move out from a capitalocentric capitalist framework talking about the commons, you need to reimagine work based on all kinds of work we need to reproduce our livelihoods. So you need new concepts. You cannot continue. In a, in a way, what I'm saying is you, to continue talking about labor in the commons does not make sense, to put it bluntly. You need to reinvent the language and reinvent the concepts. There's one which I like very much, which is the care debate. You can think about all we need to do to reproduce our livelihoods as a moment of care for oneself, for nature, and for the other. So, oops, what I'm trying to convey is the idea that planning value production in capitalism is usually producing products and can only be measured if there has been money in between, right? Well, you, you know all this, so it's the B BSP in English, product in English, can somebody help me? G GDP, right? GDP, yeah. So you usually have, thanks, you usually have a mediation through money and only then you talk about value. So again, here we need to reimagine value. We have a very nice um, play of, of wording in German, the value production chain. Mm. Uh, that, that doesn't, it doesn't work in English. Aus der, Wert, aus der Wertschöpfungskette eine Wertschätzungskette machen. Okay. <laughs> but it's very nice, isn't it? <laughs> it's very nice. So, it's, it's so we have to learn German. Yeah, you have to learn German, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and another thing is both in capitalism but also in socialism, when do you do your planning for production? Which moment do you plan for production? Which basically is, is not capitalist centric. It's yeah, yeah, it is capitalist centric. But both in socialism and in capitalism. You do it before production, right? In a commons, you do basically a self organized process. There has there has no been such a thing as, um, so we plan what's needed for Wikipedia and then we start to find the capital for it and the investments and the infrastructure, etc. You do it on the process, as a self-organized process. And if it's not possible, well then you need to find other ways to fulfill your needs. So there's not necessarily a planning before production in a commons. It's because you're based on, you need to rely on what's there. You need to ask not what I need, but what do we have? And the purpose is the very same thing. In a capitalist-centric framework, you usually produce stuff to be bought, bought and sold on the market. So to convert it into money, or, or a reward or whatever to reproduce your livelihoods through that money. In a commons, you need to think about the goal of production being covering the four or more dimensions of work. So, in other words, what I'm saying is it's very hard to talk about the commons. Uh, with a capitalist-centric wording, framework, and conceptualization. What I am not saying here is that this is the new framework and this is the way it works. But what is very kind of um, visible in this kind of framework is you can only talk about 
labor the way we do today, value production the way we do today, and planning as if it was the only, th the only way, planning before production as if, as if it was the only way to produce, to resolve the transportation system. If you first cut out half of the picture, if you first ignore that there are many more social relations needs to be fulfilled and that there is that the, the, the connection to nature needs to be inbuilt into an economic framework. So you can only do this if you basically say, I don't care for nature, I don't care for care. Okay? So we need to kind of move to mm, relation, relational concepts. That's re a relational concept rings a bell to you. What would it be? No, she, because she was saying yes. If you think of commodity, for example, in the Marxist approach, it's a process. You can't give a definition, even though after finishing the process of discussing about <laughs> of discussing about commodities, it's the whole process that makes sense. So, the the even the word definition loses its power or or sense. You care about the whole like picture you put in motion, something like that. So okay. I was thinking kind of the same thing for commons. Like, yeah. So what is a relational concept then, for you? For me, it's like a process that is built among like different persons in the society and that it has a social impact in the end. Social impact meaning that it changes the way we live, let's say, you know. Okay. Broad sense. Well, I, I'm not quite sure what you were ta talking about in the first part because I, I was saying that the way commodity is used and produced in capitalism is a problem. It's based on the disconnection from the other social functions we have, we need to reproduce our livelihoods. This was not a criticism to Marx's theory, okay? So I was not sure what you were commenting about, but um, the, the idea we want to come up with is if we need to leave this framework which is basically based on the disconnection from the whole richness of social relationships and human nature relationships, we need to build on, and, and that's a proposal, rela relational concept. And relational concepts are based, um, and here I can come back to your question on individuality. Uh, well, I is a relational concept. Right? Yes, in a way. In which way? As long as I d I'm not I, I cannot connect to you. Exactly. And, oh, well, or oh. as long as there is no you, I cannot think about I. It does not make sense to say I. So you, you only can think about I in relation to something other, to something else, to somebody else. <laughs> and this is precisely part of the answer to your question. The I is always in connection with the we, or in other way, there, it's not the I versus the we, the individual interest versus the collective interest. It's like, to try to say, we need to realize that I cannot think about me as an isolated person. I am already related to this world. I, I am mud, I am dirt, I am, I am the other, I am bacteria inhabiting me, I am whatever. So I cannot kind of be as if not, think of me as if not. And that in the comments, trying to find a way to enhance my individuality, 
there's, for me, there's no such thing. If you think about the individuality like this, there is no necessarily such thing as, well, if I engage for the community, I will be less individual. On the contrary, you can evolve your individuality through the other, because in order to involve your, evolve your individuality, you need the other. I, if not, the whole idea of individuality doesn't make sense. The moment you improve your individuality, you become better than others. The moment you become better than others, then you have this feeling that I'm better than others. And then you want to have your authority over them. The moment you have authority, it brings corruption. And the corruption in the sense like it corrupts you, your, the existence of your being. So it is very, and very it's the same thing that uh, related to you, what you were saying before. 99%. If we are 99%, so it's... But, but you see, the moment somebody created Wikipedia... Is he a political scientist? He's a biologist. Great. But wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are we talking here about what do we mean by individuality or are we talking about what do I do with my individuality? Yes, but the moment I'm in it, as, as an individual, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot see, I will cease to exist the moment I don't do anything. Right. The, the moment I start doing something, I become I. It is the self-awareness that comes to me. Yeah. You know, as an individual, I, I become I when I have the self-awareness. Yeah. You know, then I have intelligence and I try to communicate with nature first and with. Yeah. But you only will get the self-awareness in the eye of the other. Great. So we agree on this. And that. So, and then, as we evolve, we evolve in our surrounding, in nature, in the, in our environment, which includes okay. people, our family, our yeah. social surrounding, friends, and everything, and. You know, this, this thing of even goodness, badness, whatever, if you are improving, you can improve in both directions, right? Mm -hmm. It depends upon what pleases you, what you want to do. So not judging like if someone is bad or someone is good. If you want to become better at something, then you have to be better than others. It, mm -hmm. it has to be relative. Otherwise, you, it, it's, you know, it's the same, con same thing I want to say between Why I and B. Why are you insisting and I want to be better than? somebody else. I, 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 I'm not saying better, better yet. I and don't why, want to why use the word. Why are you saying that this is kind of deterministic? That's what I don't <laughs> get. So let us, again, let us, let us have this transition discussion a little bit later and just make the point that with saying, yeah, with, go, go. The important part of what he's saying is that ideology is like so inside us that it's very ah. difficult to yeah, picture exactly. a way of getting out of it. And for example, this way of thinking that I want the best for me and if I Perfect. evolve in my relationship with others is in order to become a better person. Is not uh, uh, so guys, Perfect. guys, that's guys. a very, very, very good uh, point. Sorry, guys. Uh, let's leave the discussion because we have ten minutes to for her to finish. I'm always, I'm almost uh, done. Her talk, and then we come back to your uh, important discussion and questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, but this is a perfect, <laughs> basically, it's already a perfect illustration, and you, you, you've put it bluntly, yeah. Our ideology, the way we think, is so deep in us, it goes right through us. So it's the same thing I say here for being a commoner. It's, uh, we are not born as commoners. We are born as human beings with the potential to become commoners. We were put in a world where that idea of becoming a commoner is not very fancy. We have put in, we have, well, yeah, okay, we can say that safely. Yeah, so uh, we, we are put in a world where the idea that you need to go to school to be better than the other, right? That's very fancy. So basically, you make a perfect illustration for what I'm saying that talking about the commons is basically talking about an attitude which doesn't serve very much if we don't find another framework. The two things together, our attitude, which might be even based on sheer necessity. There are people who need to find ways to be independent from the market because they have, they've already suffered it. There's no other way to make a living. Or there are people who are so upset with the mechanisms of inclusion that I came up with, we need to find something else. Whatever the motivation is, 
and where your attitude comes from. If it comes from the judge, from your education, for being a rebellion against your parents, from sheer necessity or crisis, <laughs> whatever, it doesn't matter. But as long as we cannot connect this attitude that we want to convert, so to say, from homo economicus, which we all also are, there's no that, that thing of, as you are just saying, the homo economicus is not out there, the bad guys. It's in here, right? Um, it goes right through us. And we need a framework and a language to address this and connect these concrete experiences of commoning to each other in order to, I will put it that way, to make the other framework fall apart because it just doesn't make sense. Because if we feel one thing as human beings, is that connectedness, deepening a relationship, and aliveness, being in touch with, being in nature or other people, not being lonely, not fighting alone on this market selling my labor force, simply feels better. And we'll notice that, and that's the transcultural thing in the comments. So that is why I guess we start struggling for inventing, not inventing, giving a language to the commons, connecting the very different experiences in the field. Like I said that there is a common pattern in the way we produce knowledge through Wikipedia. One for instance is that, what, what is a common pattern? between the way we produce today modern encyclopedic knowledge in Wikipedia and a way a community well is governed in the Sahara. Give me one common feature, or perhaps two. Any law students here? Everyone is using it. Who uses it? The who uses, the de what is the, the definition of who uses as part of defining the property regime, right? So who defines who uses? The right to access. Right to access. Right to access. This is a common feature. The idea that, and, and here is my, I will end with this idea. You will find very often in the literature, um, especially in history, even Aristoteles, uh, etc. Well, there are people who are saying that Belonging to all or belonging to nobody. You will very often find this idea, the commons is what belongs to all. Or the commons is what belongs to nobody. And, what then, and then it depends on the ideological thing, right? If it belongs to nobody, it will go down, and so we need to put a fence around it and privatize it. So that, that what, what you do with this is kind of very different and depends on your ideology. So, but what, in true, if you look at the field in empiries, empiry, empiry, voila. Um, the, the, the only common feature in the commons is basically that the, that the commons does not belong to only one person which is very different from saying it belongs to all or belongs to nobody. Because if you say it doesn't belong to only one person, you don't exclude property regulation. Of course not. As you all know, there's a lot of, there are a lot of property regimes in the commons and very different property regimes. And even I might say it doesn't belong to only one person. There are even very good examples for commons that in fact, in law, belong to only one person, but are ye still used and managed as a commons. Even this exists. In other words, a common feature is between all the commons, the commons don't belong to only one person. There are different, very different property regimes to regulate the access rules, use rules, etc., etc., in a commons. And if we realize that this is what uh, I will exaggerate, 99% of the world is built upon. It is a very powerful concept and can change the world.
Perfect. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and give about a 20 minutes uh, discussion. And we had originally paired, prepared for the paper that you sent in the video from 2013, I think, at a conference. So this is going to read a little bit differently than some of the stuff you said, but it should be interesting. Um, <laughs> So the plan for the next 20 minutes, I'm going to go ahead and do a quick introduction to the commons. Um, that's going to be mostly from Corey Arts um, and Ostrom's thoughts. So it's going to be a little bit different from what we just heard, but vaguely still the same. Um, and that's going to be mainly focused for the option B and C kids who haven't done this before, because I know option A, you've been living in this. Um, they're going to have a case example, a quick discussion of the 2013 paper and lecture that we had looked at. We have a couple shorter questions, and then I have one little bit longer question that we've actually been talking about this entire time, so it's not as novel anymore. Um, so when I started researching this week, uh, commons, oh yeah, tragedy of the commons. That's all I know about commons is that they're a horrible idea and we need to privatize them. Um, so apparently that's not all that's going on. Um, but, this, but this, for a lot of economists or people with familiarity with economics, is the starting point. Um, this article, Tragedy of the Commons, written by an ecologist. And the main idea was that population growth is going to be going up forever and that it's a tragedy, so we have to have some kind of constraints to limit that. So one of the famous examples is the sheep in England in before the enclosure movement. If everybody grazes their sheep on the pasture, nobody has an incentive to make sure your sheep eats doesn't doesn't eat too much, and so all of the land gets overgrazed. But if we put up fences and everyone has their own little pastures, then everything will be fine. So that's sort of the starting point, um, that commons are tragic. But sometimes commons aren't tragic, apparently. Uh, it turns out, particularly in the, uh, the English grazing case, it just wasn't true that the common system fell apart. There's a lot of other things going on, particularly changes in agriculture and the Industrial Revolution and some key land policy reforms that really changed that system. Um, and when you think it did work for hundreds, maybe a thousand years, and then fell apart when major changes started happening, maybe it isn't the form of commons themselves that are so horrible. Um, so going back to the guy who wrote the original tragedy of the commons paper, in the 1990s, he wrote an article that was saying that to judge from all of the critics that I've gotten over the last 40 years, I wish I'd put in the word unmanaged, tragedy of the unmanaged commons. So that's nice, but what are the unmanaged commons? Um, and he does, he describes it. A managed commons describes either socialism or privatism of free enterprise. Either may work, either may fail. But if you have an unmanaged commons, which is somehow not either of those things, that's definitely going to fail because it reduces the carrying capacity and ruin is, inevi ruin is inevitable. So what he gives us is a market state dichotomy that if you are to manage your commons, you're effectively either having the government take control of them or having private enterprise take control of them. Um, but we can do better than that. We have the commons literature now. Um, so I'm jumping into what's mostly coming from Eleanor Ostrom, but the actual format is copied from a uh, Corey Art paper where he summarized a lot of her works. So we can think of building blocks of what makes a common. Um, and you have a resource as the foundation of it. There's a bundle of rights that are built around that resource, and then a governing structure that is built to enforce and manage and control those rights. I'm going to walk through each of these one by one. So the resource, as we had the, the box here with rival and excludable goods, the idea is there are some things that are fairly suited to be public goods, some things fairly suited to be private goods, and some things that don't really fit into either box, that don't work very well. Those are the prime candidates for commons. That doesn't mean that they have to be commons or that they are commons or that other things can't be commons, but generally in the literature, these are sort of your archetypical cases. This is where you start when you're talking about what are the commons um, and where they come from. So things like fisheries, forests, grazing land, uh, where you can keep people out, but not very easily, and where you can take as much as you want from a forest, but at some point that does become a problem. Um, so what people generally do to deal with these resources in commons is create bundles of rights. And the four bundles of rights that Ostrom identifies is access and withdraw, first, the ability to be able to go to the commons and take things from the commons, 
management of the commons, the ability to make decisions about and for the commons, exclusion, which is the ability to keep other people from using the commons, and then alienation, which is the ability to buy and sell and manage, or I guess sell and lease your part of the commons. And so we can think of these different rights being bundled together to create different roles. So if you can just access the commons, then you're just an authorized user. As in, you might, we're all authorized users of Wikipedia because we can all go there. But then one, some people have management positions. Other people are able to ban people from Wikipedia. They have exclusion rights. And so these rights are built together. Um, Based on what types of rights are dominant within a particular common, you have different types of commons. So the smallest would be clubs and cartels, which would be categorized by either ownership or very, very small, limited access to the commons. So looking here, if you have someone who is the owner of the common but then allows a few other people to access it, that's what would be in mind with a club. Um, then very large commons, which could be something like the ocean, where everyone has, manage, has access rights effectively um, because it's almost impossible to stop people, even if there are some rules around it. Um, and then community-based management. This is sort of the, the just-in-between perfect zone where we generally talk about the kind of typical commons cases um, with relatively small communities of rights holders. And so the third thing is governance, that it's not enough just to have these rights, you have to have some kind of structure that enforces and maintains these rights. Um, and one of the main things that this stresses is that the structure is designed to manage conflicts between members of the commons, um, and particularly to manage the free rider problem, which is something that comes up a lot with the commons. Uh, this can be a legal state-based authority, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and in a lot of the cases, it seems like the better management isn't from state authority. So the Ostrom has eight principles for managing the commons. So we don't have a ton of time to get into all of these clearly, but there are just some general ideas that you wanna have clear group boundaries, be able to respond to local needs and conditions, make sure people can partic participate, be able to make sure that the commons works well with outside authorities, other level of government, um, and, and just sort of general rules for how the governance structure works. And, and so this is a really powerful idea because it's able to be applied to lots of different things. And you can see some of the things that are true for Wikipedia might also be true for a fishery in Maine and that's where some of the power of the common literature comes from is that it's able to make these broader generalizations um, so even though we we're told not to give definitions of the commons I will because I found one um, that <laughs> takes all of this together uh, a common can be defined as a set of resources that is collectively managed by means of structure and govern a structure of governance that distributes rights between commoners and aims to ensure the well-ordered sustainable exploitation of the resources and now we're going to go to a case example so you can tell more concretely what we're talking about yeah thank you uh, so my task was to um, to come up with some uh, juice example, so it would be f interesting for all of us, and I think many of us can was were using them. Actually, we have access right to this commons. So th this story sta uh, starts in mid uh, 1990s. The programmer at MIT, uh, Richard uh, Stoman, changed the paradigm how the software created. Uh, he came up with a general public license. It's a type of copyright that very often called copyleft because, um, because it gives you a guarantee uh, of free running, using, uh, copying and changing the code, changing the software. And this is how the, uh, the free, libre, um, uh, open source software movement was born. And let's put this example in this uh, framework that J. Christopher was uh, just talking about. So what here is this building building blocks? Can you, can you see it clear? In this case, the, the resource, the basis of the commons is uh, knowledge typed into code. So actually it is a code. And we have uh, the general public license, which is the bundle of rights within the community of developers using this basic resource uh, in order to uh, grow and enrich the common pool 
of, of this resource. Um, and now we're coming closer to this to the topic actually of uh, today's lecture. What originally was common creating pure economy, and uh, our uh, speaker in the paper that was given uh, was made in uh, four conceptual points. We were talking about this point that uh, commons is not a resource but a process, and if we uh, install it into our presentation, in even uh, when we are talking about these building blocks. So the commons, the resource in these building blocks, it's only one of these building blocks. It's not whole commons at all. It's important part, but it's not commons. Um, second part, you also was mentioning that every, um, so we need to change the categorization definitions of uh, different types of commons because every commons is a knowledge commons it's, it's a social commons it's uh, and it's a natural commons all together um, three um, point number three every common need protection this is why we put this uh, building block as a um, bundle of rights this different type of rights right to access to withdraw management exclusion rights and right to alienate so all members in the community should underst explicitly understand how these rights are and how how they who are, who is who who can do what and who couldn't. Uh, number four, commons does not uh, scale up but rather slowly crystallized, and this is very questionable topic. Like we would like to hear more about you from you about this. Um, Principle of commoning. This is also uh, mentioned in the in the book. Actually, I bought already that book. Um, yeah, two more. <laughs> <laughs> no, I bought online. I, I, I mean e version. But um, uh, so first principle. It's uh, we also were talking about it, but let's f let's f crystallize it in this way. It is actually changing a, a world view how we should look, how we should measure uh, the, the, the value of everything, measure of thinking in terms of using uh, a usage value or value for money. Uh, second, a second uh, principle is indirect reciprocity. It actually in means that if you take something, you also need to contribute indirectly, but still, you if you are in this commons, you still have to contribute. Uh, Self-organization and self-healing, it's more about um, conflict-resolving uh, mechanism. Um, free knowledge and white technology is that that key, of in key for commons is a knowledge sharing. And it's not, uh, uh, it's something that uh, should be basic and understood by everyone. Protection. Uh, again, it's prevention of abuse and uh, reappropriation of the uh, of the common resources, and trial error mechanism. What is actually fun because it's like uh, managing commons is like learning all the time. So you should be ready that the you will make a mistakes and you should try more to uh, find a right solution. Now we come closer to the questions, and actually we have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, we have like uh, this five not not big ones and one like literally huge. Uh, <laughs> so uh, first one, when we are talking about reality now, and we are see that there is the there are commons, and obviously there are states and uh, markets and market mechanism. How they how they all together. Um, reflect to each other, how they, wha what is the uh, connection or disconnection? It's first question. Second question, uh, can we get more framework of this comment, commenting? Or it is <laughs> impossible to generalize because the comments are so specific and they have very specific uh, structure or architecture depending on uh, community, depending on resource, depending. so. Can we do it or it's not possible? Um, third question. 
what kind of global commons possible? Is it more closely to uh, knowledge commons, global knowledge commons more possible than global resource common, uh, commons like climate, for example? Um, first question, that, uh, that is maybe is the shortest one, mm -hmm. because uh, I, I believe you know what is um, economy for the common good. And um, I think few people also know in the audience. And f for me, it is close. Uh, for everyone, I will say economy for a common good is alternative movement that uh, focus on more collaboration and common good rather than competition in economy. And from this point, like change everything, the old uh, system. So how the economy for the common good and a common creative peer economy connecting? Mm -hmm. Or maybe you have some cooperation even. Mm, second, the, the fifth yeah. And then um, for the option B, finance people in the room, uh, reading about the commons, I was wondering if there's something we can learn for the global monetary system that can come out of the commons, particularly talking about not necessarily at the point where we have the great transition to like the commons economy, but just like right now today, if I become if I go work in a central bank, um, it seems like a lot of the features of the commons and some of the rules and things I talked about could inform and have some implications for how we could better control the money supply. Um, so a little bit bigger question, um, which you actually answered a handful of times by saying literally everything can be a common. Um, but from the presentation and paper I read, it wasn't particularly clear uh, the answer to this as far as are really, can everything in the world, the entire world economy, can that be a common? Um, so that's sort of getting at this question is, can common, should commons be something that complements markets and states, or are we talking about completely replacing them? So just to walk through that a bit, uh, we've talked a lot about this state market duopoly, or, or yeah, dichotomy, where you've got uh, public goods made by governments, private goods made by the private sector. And most of us aren't particularly satisfied with that. Um, and so what commons does is it creates another category and another place where you can say, okay, some things are public ownership, some are private ownership, and then there's this other thing called the commons, and that's another way of thinking about how production is organized. And it also opens the door for other forms of organization that we're not necessarily talking about or haven't formalized. Um, but it, but it, it's a way to break this dilemma of all or nothing between state and market. Um, but then there, there's sort of this other idea of, what if the uh, commons did everything? Um, the commons as completely replacing both the state and the market as the overwhelming pr economic governing structure for the world economy. Um, and and that's, very, that's a huge idea, that's very interesting. Um, and I just, I guess I kind of wanted to, so from, from your lecture in 2013, you said that we could bypass, hack, or undermine the market state duopoly with a coherent concept of the, cons of the commons uh, and talked about an economic paradigm shift. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little more explicitly about exactly how far are we talking about going and like what would this look like in a real daily life? Because that's really cool as far as being that big. It just raises so many questions that kind of it takes it to a whole new level as far as talking about scalability. Can we really do this? Would it really be better for people um, and it sort of raises the stakes as far as the questions um, and here's a bibliography in case anyone thought we made up the sources and bonus question um, we're wondering what your favorite common was <laughs> so <laughs> Uh, we are giving 25 to 30 minutes, depending on how much um, the c to answer their questions. Then we are open to the audience to discuss. Yeah. Uh, that, uh, it will be difficult to be short on that one. I, uh, I you the floor. Yeah, the sm yeah. Small, small questions. Oh, thank you so much for diving deeply into, into what we have done. That, that's really great to see. Um, but might I start with challenging your definition? Sure. 
uh, and, and not for challenging uh, and I will try to make a definition because I'm constantly doing the, constantly doing the same thing and trying to define the comments because so many times uh, journalists come and what is the comments, can you tell me? Short and sweet, please. 30 seconds. Um, but there was one thing that I'm especially puzzled with, with because if you still draw and uh, in a way you did on the resource framework, right, the categories, and and then you came up with there are several levels of comments and the first one being clubs and cartels as comments. One of my favorite questions is then so is the mafia and the golf club a comments, right? And um, it fits. I mean, you put it there. Yes, it is. And then you came up with a definition saying that comments is about sustainability. Which, if I think about the mafia and the golf club, I don't think about sustainability in the first place. So I would challenge your definition. You need to rewrite it based on that clubs and cartels are common as well thing. We won't resolve this here. It's just that, and uh, that is a challenge for those of you who study sustainability or who, who, who will work on a new economic framework in the future. I actually think that there is no inbuilt feature of sustainability in the commons, which is not good news. But most traditional commons are more sustainable than market-based governed or state-governed forestry, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there's no such thing as uh, Wikipedia sustainable. Um, th th those who work in that knowledge commons realm, they, they usually understand by sustainability, uh, Wikipedia gets 6 million this year and will get 6.5 million next year. That's what I understand by sustainability. So, but if you think about how we have access to knowledge and how many times we connect and how many, many carbon we burn um, exchanging and and, and using the knowledge spaces in the internet, you kind of talk about sustainability seriously. So this is something we really, really, really need to work upon in the commons movement. I, I, the challenge is that I think traditional commons are usually more sustainable in ecologic, in ecologic terms than other governance systems, but there is no such thing as an inbuilt sustainability mechanism in a commons. <coughs> Hence, it is more prone to be sustainable. And why is that? Because usually you start asking the question, what we have. You don't make a management plan, a business plan, whatever, because you don't start thinking about, OK, what can I produ produce for the market and the sell on the market, so where is the demand for? But you start the other way around. What do we have? How can we gather the resources available to us to do what we need to do, what we want to do, or to resolve a concrete problem. That is that from the very beginning, you usually kind of are more connected with the resources that are actually there and that they need to be replenished. But again, I repeat, there is no mechanism of something like becomes a sustainable thing. It should not be part of the definition. So, but now, I, I, I very much appreciate it, um, your talk. Um, um, and we'll try to, yeah, try to answer at least, give a short answer at least to the five, to the five question. What about the market mechanism and the state, the role of the market and the state? Mm, it, I guess it relates back to the, tr the whole transition question. This is here. Um, next month we will have by the way, with your professor, Benjamin Correa, is the professor ici, no? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So he'll be part of an international group uh, that we gather uh, near Potsdam, where the famous Potsdam conference in 45 was, was held. And we'll sit down and talk three days only about the relationship of the commons and the market. And I will ask them to really disconnect from the internet and from their former ideas they came with and really sit down and try to do some... I'll try to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know, it's a challenge. 
Uh, he's not the only one. Um, and um, so I was, was studying a little bit state theory lately. Yeah? Um, because the, fir but the first thing perhaps I, I want to state here, because I can only put it very bluntly, is if you read the very slogan of the comments beyond the market and state, I'm not an English native speaker. But if I put it into German, it's Commons jenseits von Markt und Staat. So beyond is not the same thing as without, right? For me, I'm not sure in English. It's not the same. If not, it would. Uh, Elinor Ostrom has been very meticulous with wording. So if she would have meant without market and state, and she clearly didn't, she would have put without, and she didn't. So beyond means at least a changing rule. And that is kind of self-evident. Same thing goes for the market. When I said at the beginning that it's the, 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 the basic question, it all comes down is, and you can re, um, reprocher, vorwerfen, uh, um, accuse. <laughs> Good to have a translator here. Uh, accuse, you can accuse the Commons framework for being anthropocentric in a way. Because if it comes down to one question, what, what would be kind of the most important question to me in the Commons debate? The who controls. So um, let me put it in a transition scenario. If we convert everything into a Commons, yeah? We want to build a house, which is the most crucial thing today as a young human being to become independent from the immobiliary market, real estate, from the real estate market. So many young people in Germany come up with co-housing projects because they know that's the only way they find to still pay rent for a kind of reasonable fee and even to get independent from the future real estate market because they find models in here in the commons to co-purchase and convert it into common property. So you make kind of here a first mechanism of independence of the markets for your own together with other people. You do the same thing and by the way these things overlap of course they are not separated I just put them separated in order to to make a nicer picture, so to say. You do the same thing for your car. This is supposed to be a wheel, okay, for transportation. You do the same thing for food production. <coughs> the famous um, community supported agriculture projects, Solidarische Landwirtschaft uh, in Germany, etc. So there are plenty of food cooperatives, plenty of projects. Um, you do the same thing for knowledge production, etc., etc. So what happens here is the way of reproducing our livelihoods was individuals went working somewhere and then they went here to buy what they need for shelter, food, knowledge, whatever, right? So you shape the public space basically in a way that every transaction and motion you do as an individual focuses on a center, which in Europe tends to be the state if it's a hospital or a university, and the market if it's for food and, and stuff. So just imagine these same people now go here, and all these commons connect to each other. which is not the switch from a centralized concept to a decentralized concept. It is a switch from a centralized or decentralized concept to a distributed concept. Do you get the point? 
No. In sustainability, we have, we have or in, in, in political literature, we have, yeah, because it's a very bad drawing. That's why you don't get so it's blame, blame. shame on me. Mm. I'll put it more clearly here. Centralization is this, OK? The state or the market commands, or whomever, or uh, the father commands at home. So this is not a privilege of the state of the market to be centralized. A decentralized concept is this. And then very often, like in a federal republic, the decentralized centers connect to each other. And a distributed concept is this. Everything can connect with everything. So it would like be like this, which we clearly don't have in today's state structure. You see the difference? <laughs> this is the, this is top down and this is distributed. This is only a gradual difference and this, a, this is a paradigmatical difference. So basically what people like Michel Bowens and I, you know, this, et cetera, are saying is, that is what I was saying when I said, I don't care if I want to convince or if, if I can convince a capitalist or not to, or the powerful to switch to that. They won't. Even more, <laughs> I was into politics and I went off because I found it a loss of energy. And I will, I will re-engage next week, but that's another thing. Um, <laughs> So what we basically say is, what we need is a framework for co-constructing these distributed centers of commons, so that can people, they can choose to go another way than that one. And the more they choose to go another way than that one, you see what happens. Today it's called, this is always in the news. If this happens, it's always in the news. Because what, what, what it means is today that this space shrinks, gets smaller and smaller, or closes down. It might, means less labor force for the market. And today this is almost every time only framed as a strategy and never as an opportunity for building something else. But it doesn't need to be that way. The question for me is not so much how many people lost their job in here. The very interesting question is what do, we, what do they do? How do they earn a livelihood? Is there somebody from Russian, Russia here? I, I, I really wonder how people in Russia, after uh, I'm from East Germany, somebody else from the Eastern Bloc? Yeah. <laughs> right. But uh, for me, the most interesting case is Russia, because Mos Moscow is meant to be one of the most expensive cities in the world, right? Well, actually, it's like everything by cheaper than here. Ah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, well, pa well, Paris is. <laughs> uh, come to Berlin, then. It's better. Anyway, no, come to the countryside, anyway. OK. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I always wondered how people in Russia who get 300 ruble, 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 yeah? No, no, you get 200 euros, which is without the ruble. You don't get 200 Yeah, anyway, 300 euros, which is very, which is not very much, so to say, uh, can make a living well, under the current conditions. So how do they do? And do they rely, it's just a question, do they rely also on other mechanisms of provisioning? Uh, well, yes, so many of them have, uh, like, grandmothers and fathers who have uh, house communities, and uh, they grow themselves in the place, like potatoes, but it's more reliable for the more, more eastern regions. 
Yeah, Thank you. exactly. So, so, so basically, that, that, that is a good example to say, so can we do something to focus on these other means of provisioning? It, it's very common for us to have uh, like these commons. It's like basically how we lived in the all previous years in these villages. Everybody was um, actually living on the commons, making the common like cows, common food, uh, vegetables, etc., and sharing exactly. between each other. Yeah. Like building the house, like there were the whole village who was building the house for each other. Exactly. So. Yeah, exactly. So that that is that is a very good. The, the thing that like uh, I really still need to understand why it's so hard for people to understand this. Why it's so hard to no, not to understand to imagine it. I think it's a problem, a challenge of imagination. Um, that, that is why we always say, no, this is nothing new. This has always been there. This is, this is normality. This is the rule. This one is the exception. It is very recent in history. So, but what I wanted to do is, so let's kind of refocus on other ways of provisioning in order to make people going more there than there. That's all. So that so far for the role of the state in the market, more theoretical framework. I just wanna wanna make one point on the theoretical framework. Um, we saw very quickly the design principles for Eleanor Ostrom, right? Which part of the group has really worked a little bit on the design principles? Hey, people, come on. Okay. So I assume, because it was so quickly, that you could not really absorb the message. But that's not a problem, because it's literally everywhere. So you give Elinor Ostrom design principles for commons institutions, and you'll find them, the eight of them. So what I think is missing there is her principles are called design principles for long-lasting commons institutions. So what she basically says is five. I can see it. Ten. What she basically is saying is that if you want to, for this common here, you need to have certain conditions to make the institution work. <coughs> so she basically gives design principles for the institution, right? So like, how do we set up? How do we make, um, how do we set up the limits? This is the first one. Do we need a monitoring system? Yes, we do, this kind of stuff. Does the state need to recognize that this is a self-organized thing? Yes, he needs to. So this, this kind of stuff. So what I don't find in Ostrom very much, you can find it in the field studies, in the case studies, but what I don't find in Ostrom very much is how the relationships among people are governed or dealt with. So the very question, this is what we call commoning within a commons institution. How do we do it? So we have, if, we, if we are used to do something else, that is go to the shop and buy the stuff we need, how will we learn to do commoning? And are there, and this is the question, common principles, not only at an institutional level, but also for interacting with each other. For the real, she says, there needs to be conflict resolution done by the people themselves. That's pretty clear. And too bad it's not normality today. But then the very question is, how do we do this conflict resolution? Are there such thing as common design principles for the concrete interaction at this level, this inner commons? And here, what we suggest and why the book is called Patterns of Commoning, as a theor theoretical framework, is pattern theory. Does anybody know the patent series software programmers here? One, so you might be familiar with. Design patterns in software programming. Like iterator. Like 
I mean, uh, there, pl there are plenty of design patterns. So in order to do a good, okay, yeah. you understand? Yeah, I don't speak your <laughs> geek language, but well, in order to, go <laughs> to do a good program, you need to kind of mm, obey to certain patterns yeah. that can resolve a frequent happening problem over and over again without ever being the, the very same thing. Okay? So can you think about this idea that, uh, let, let me give a very, good, uh, very easy example. We are in a room here. Does this room feel cozy? No. 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 Yeah. It's awful <laughs> being here, okay. Yeah. I mean, that, that is the very thing. You come in, you look at the room, and almost 99% of the people say, uh, uh, right? So the, well, 99%, he doesn't. I am the 1%. He is the 1%. So pattern theory basically says there is a frequent problem. For instance, people want to learn in a room, and I want to feel good um, to stay there. So pattern theory comes from a um, theorist, his name is, his philosopher and architect, his name is Christopher Alexander. <coughs> he says, wherever you are in the world, you find kind of common patterns which may, which enable you to build the room in such a way that the people will come in and say, oh, that's so lovely, I want to go out. And he wrote a book fi 50 years ago almost called The Timeless Way of Building. And he describes 272 or something patterns of how to build a room, a house, a public space, and a city in such a way that you feel inspired and alive. <coughs> and his simple definition of a pattern is a pattern is such a thing that enables you to solve a problem that occurs over and over again without ever being twice the same thing. Okay? For instance, daylight from at least two sides. You only have one. That's no daylight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you understand the idea? So what we want to do on the theoretical basis is can we find these very concrete patterns? So, for instance, I have a fight with you in the comments. I want to do a co-housing project with you, but you don't agree with the way I want to do, right? Is there a way in human experience we can draw on to deal with our conflict? Relationship Sorry? Relationship of authority. Job contracts. Yeah. Relationship of authority. It's like Benjamin Korea brought he told us, like for conflict resolution or we routine. can have routines. Or but there routines. Routines. Or incentives. It's not a very common stock. <laughs> incentives. <laughs> incentives. Yeah, exa yeah, of course capitalism has patterns. Yeah. Of or course. Or yeah. trust. Or trust. Exactly. Of course, the patterns, the patterns idea as a theoretical framework is not, uh, you, you can use it forward. That you, ca you, ca you, ca you can basically have patterns for making a good war so to say. So that's not the point. So what we, what we want to do, and why this book is called uh, uh, Patterns of Comedy, is we want to draw on the enormous amount of literature, of human experience, about how people, it's, it's everything there, everything is there. Sociocracy and uh, deep ecology and youth theory, and you have it. It's everything there. Okay, so much for theoretical framework. I guess I'm all <laughs> kind of more global. Is global commons possible? Well, we said before that. Uh, first of all, let me say that I think that there are only extremely few problems that need to be resolved at a global basis. I really think that's no more than three or four. Fishery? Climate thing? Mm. That's it. Capitalism. Capitalism. <laughs> Sorry? What about economies of scale? If you solve everything locally, you won't get economies of 
That is the fifth question. Why do we need economies of scale? What for? Uh -huh. so in theory, and yeah. We relate to each other, you know, yeah. Okay, but your question. This is this is the okay. fifth question. I will come back to this, but I would challenge the idea that we that people need an economy of scale. Let let me let me just ask the global commons question. Uh, answer to the com global commons question. So I say that there are no, no so many things that we need to treat as a global commons because there are no so many. The, the good thing in yeah. <laughs> the good thing is the commons in the commons. And here is a. If we said that the commons relates to a resource system, let's say this is the the border of the resource system, like a great uh, lake region, great lakes in in the U.S. between U.S. and Canada, for instance are the um, hydro, how is it called in English, w between watershed and watershed, the region between one watershed and the other, right? So a hydrographical region, so to say. And it is pretty clear to everybody that the, r the, r the limits of the resource system almost never match, almost never, some do, the borders of countries. This is where one of the conflicts between the commons and the state stems from. Because within here, between countries, you negotiate in the national interest and tend to forget about the whole of the resource system, which is usually cross-border. So, but the good news is that many, many things we can deal with, being it forest, reforestation, uh, river, whatever, etc., is still at the scale that can be managed in commons, community-based or network-based or whatever. So yes, it, add, it adds up and it sums up, and adding up and summing up also makes the scale, so to say. Uh, but I would not exclude at this point that converting a, 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 a shared resource into a commons mm, can only be done at a local scale because we have at least two good examples at a global scale, which is the Montreal, Proto Montreal Protocol. When in the 70s they realized that the ozone hole grows bigger and bigger and bigger. They set up, this is, I guess it was the first treaty they ever managed in um, sustainability related issues to, to, to come up with. And they set up the Montreal Protocol which basically was the starting point to forbid those gases who make the ozone hole growing bigger and bigger. And the other one is an international treaty on plant genetic resources, which is also based on a commons framework. And the other one are, is a kind of figure in international law, which is called um, common, the, the common heritage of mankind. The interesting thing of that common heritage of mankind is that it's basically applied to things that we don't yet exploit economically, like the outer space or the metallic resources on the moon. So uh, it's true. I mean, in legal terms, the moon <coughs> belongs to you and to you and to you and to you and to me, in legal terms. So. Um, based on international law, based on a common figure with co which is common heritage of mankind. Same to the, how is it uh, they call it the bottom of the sea? Seabed. The seabed, yeah, the seabed. Uh, it's the same thing. And you realize that the ice is melting and that now the nations which have borders with the Arctic region, North Pole, they are starting a rise to the bottom to the seabeds and they're putting, Russia was putting their flag on, on, on the ground of the sea to say, hey, here's my territory. Because now they are able to exploit um, the metallic resources on the sea and in the deep sea. So we need to make sure that this idea of common heritage of mankind 
survives, so to say, the new grab of resources. And the problem is that nation states, as they behave today, tend to start the next race for those resources against each other. So, yes, there is a role for international negotiations, state-based negotiations. Yes, there are at least two good examples in history. But uh, the upcoming conflicts in terms of outer space resources, um, sea bad resources, etc., seems to show that national states are not very interested in protect the, the commons as a common heritage of mankind. Um, I'll take one more, and then I'm done. But because it's relatively easy. Yes, we work with... Uh, have you been working here with Christian Felber? To invite him. Christian Felber. Ah. Yes. No, not this year. <laughs> the difference. Uh, okay, so let me. Ch ch change. Okay, so he makes the same claim, doesn't he? Change everything. The very difference is that Christian Felber writes <laughs> every book alone <laughs> and is kind of the messiah of this movement. Yeah. So you agree with that? Because I was going to ask you. <laughs> <laughs> I am not agreeing with being a messiah of any message. Okay, because that is scary. That, that is, is very scary. Okay, so if you invite him, tell him. And oh, don't yeah. say that I agree with you. Oh, because yes, I work with him. Um, <laughs> but you remember that you... Wait, sorry, wait. Sorry? Uh, you will be on the record. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> Cut it out, please. We've had people. <laughs> okay, 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 no, yeah, we cut this out, okay, so, um, <laughs> no, this is political, really, um, okay, I'll, I'll, first of all, I'll put the name, I'll put the name for you, for those who don't know him, right, invite him. He has set up very, very, very successfully um, this um, economy of the common good, which has some very, where are my notes here? Very interesting ideas, uh, similar to ours, uh, um, of course. And there are, after rethinking it and rethinking it and rethinking it, I came to the conclusion that Two of the main problems of the economy, economy of the common good is how the whole movement is organized itself, mm -hmm. which is they are organized as a business and they depend on this business being a success economically, which I think is highly dangerous. And the second thing is that they continue <laughs> measuring things. When you were asking a question, um, during the talk or giving the talk, he said, how do we measure value? When you ask that very question, you seem to have a concept of value, which I'm not sure is the same concept of value I would defend as reimagining value in the comments, first thing. And second, you seem to, ha to see a, a very necessity to measure it. Why is that? Look at the example we just had when I said, hey, does it feel good to be here? No, we don't need to measure it. We just feel it. So what about reframing the thing and say, how do we feel nurtured and alive in the commons? As a measure of value, you know what I mean? Just how do we get enlivenment, <laughs> feeling, emotions, connectedness, back into the whole picture of looking at the economy? And if you do that, you need at least complementary instruments than measurement. And the common good economy sticks to the measurement idea. Now, they put me much more things into, we measure this and that and that. Now, why do I think still it's very valuable? Because when they do it, it's so fucking complicated that they need to start a huge conversation within every enterprise to talk about how will we do that. 
And it's about this huge conversation that it really matters because it transforms people. It makes them being aware of th the many things, the way they are producing are connected to and the other people which are affected by. And it makes actually there is a potential to transform social relationships through that process of starting to write another balance. You got the point? So at a very deep level, he doesn't talk about this. Well, yes, he talks about this, but as a messias. But at a very deep level, yeah, they, they, they enact a cultural paradigm shift. And that's what matters. I, I'll leave it there because. Uh, so we are making uh, a row of four questions, getting, gathering some questions and coming back to you. Thanks. Um, hello, my, my name is Guillaume. Um, Your name is? William, if you want. From? <laughs> from? <laughs> <laughs> I can do William. Uh, from? Where do you come from? From France. I'm French, actually. Um, ah, Guillaume. Guillaume, yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> voilà. um, uh, I got the, the impression, uh, frankly, that many, uh, that lots of questions that, that were made to you, you answer in a very uh, vague way, um, especially on the questions uh, which were uh, uh, asking about uh, material problems. Um, you talk about changing framework, uh, you talk about changing the concept of value, uh, and, and, y and then you say, if you do that, but you don't explain how we do that. Um, uh, you talk about this uh, story of I and we that I didn't really understand about the, um, uh, the fact that uh, individualism is still a s very strong value in our society and that it won't disappear tomorrow. And um, I got the feeling that you don't want to tackle the question of, uh, how uh, you confront to capitalism. Because uh, I'm very convinced that the day you will put in danger uh, for real capitalist interest, uh, you will face a uh, contradiction because uh, capitalism is a macro-social force and uh, I there's only one macro-social force that can uh, put in danger for real and, and during a long time uh, the, interest, the interest of capitalists and it's called the, the state. Uh, and uh, <coughs> The day the state will make a law to force some resources or, or, or another to be uh, exploited only by uh, authorized private companies, um, how uh, we will be able? How we w would it be possible to to continue build commons? I mean, for example, in in south of uh, uh, of Paris, there were uh, uh, municipalities starting to to put uh, uh, water uh, in commons uh, with. Uh, um, kind of commons uh, with democratic uh, uh, decisions made partly by citizens, partly by, by uh, uh, elected member of the city council and, uh, and everything. And uh, basically the, the, the companies started uh, trials against the, uh, the, 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 the elected member of, of, of the council who, who, who started the, this project. And, an, and another example for me, uh, because I, I am a developer and I, uh, uh, in a way, maybe I'm a commoner because I participate to uh, many open source projects and uh, we're many people there uh, are talking about uh, free software and which are still man as the example of a wonderful commons which works and from the inside I would say um, it's much more complicated because today if you take github for example which is a platform where you have lots of projects more than uh, half of the most popular projects on this platform are sponsored either by google facebook or twitter and um, if you take linux today it's developed more than 90 percent by people who are paid by big companies mm -hmm. and linux today is just for me a big joint ventures uh, it's not at all under the control of any individual and, uh, and certainly not at all under the control of people from the Free Software Foundation. Mm -hmm. So capitalism fights back mm -hmm. and I don't see a real answer uh, to this problem in the presentation we got today. <laughs> um, I, I, mm, it's difficult because it's so complex. Can we gather? Can we gather? But not so many because if not I forget the most important yeah, things. Yeah. She can answer. Yeah. 
Okay, you can answer him and then we follow. <laughs> ah, I can answer. Okay, great. No, no, no. Well, um, I don't have control. It, it is very. Uh, no, th thanks for the question um, because it um, sometimes it very much depends of how you start framing your talk, right? If I would focus on struggles for commoning, well, I would focus on struggles <coughs> for commoning. So that that's uh, the first thing. Um, and perhaps a biographical thing. Um, it's, it is important to know where people come from and where they talk from. So I've been, by, I've been basically fighting 10 years against free trade agreement, agreements in Latin America. And it is so exhausting. And the most frustrating thing that comes up with it that the more time you spend in fighting those agreements, the less time you have for building a commons. So this is obviously not an argument for not doing both at the same time, but it's an argument for the division of labor among activists, so to say. So, so now it's my turn to, to, to talk about the vision and not, um, and, and as I said, next week I will go back to, go back to politics and fight and challenge um, politics. Um, but what I certainly think is, I was surprised that you started your question with uh, that I seem to avoid material problems. It is interesting that you frame um, capitalism and the, the, the political struggle as a material problem. I think actually it's a mental problem. It, it is, it's about the mental infrastructures. There is a wonderful text by Harald Welzer, a German sociologist. You should, you might, you might use Harald Welzer. It's available in, in English. And he coined that, that idea of mental infrastructures. And I think that the, the most important thing today to help us switching from from one world to another world is that actually we lack the capacity to even imagine something else. So I, for the moment, want to contribute to, to this. And um, it does not all, it means fighting and resisting always. I, and, 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 and in the very real world, the commons is about, is about life and death. It, 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 it's that cruel. But it's also about building something new without necessarily challenging life and death. What does this mean? What did Richard Matthew Stallman did, and most of the software community did never understand? He put a protection to the commons. You remember one of the principles I mentioned in my talk? You've read in the talk, I, I said, commons need protection. And you, as a principle, as a pattern, of, as an institutional pattern for commons. And this is a legal fight over the top of everything. An extremely important legal fight. Many of the so software programmers, the Linux people, don't understand. The open source people don't understand free software so to say. So this is a little bit of geek talk, but you might explain to your colleagues later. So um, what the important thing is here that he used the copyright and converted it to copyleft in order to avoid that what was transferred from the market to the commons will be transferred back. So he built a legal protection based on copyright law to say, once it's in the commons, it needs to stay there. And this is a legal fight, an extremely important political fight. That is why we said, so we can hack things, hacking the law, for instance. And if you put it that way, it is not a problem that many software programmers are paid by Google as long as you make sure what has been created in the commons doesn't go back to the market. Decide. Sorry? Decide. Not in the commons. That's, that's the point. You need to make, if you don't make the disconnection, if you don't, if you don't protect the commons from that logic, you will destroy the commons with money, obviously. You on the use of commons. Who uses it? And how you use it? Exactly, exactly. 
you need, but, but, but that, that's, it's a very good example. What Richard Matthew Stallman understood is, he needs to disrupt the logic of who pays these sites. And he used, and he used, and he used, um, well, for instance, in Wikipedia now, this has been a long struggle with Wikipedia until this was applied to the whole of Wikipedia. And in Wikipedia, you have a very clear example that you don't have the who pays, decides thing. The decoupling from giving and taking is essential to a commons. And you need to invent patterns, institutions, organizational models, decision-making processes that m protect this other logic. And this is really what I think, why, uh, for me, Richard Matthew Stallman is a hero, and the open software community doesn't get it. That would be a wonderful conversation. And I hope the others got basically the idea. So who has? Uh, He's a hero, but with very low social skills. Just cutting off. Them. Hello, thanks. So everybody knows that. Thank you for the presentation. I would like to know uh, what are the incentives to be a commoner? What, what, what do they want uh, for, for the others and for them? Um. I um, I'm, I'm very much confused. I am um, and somehow worried about, uh, as you said, mm, how all this commons um, approach is handled by many activists. Because sometimes I feel, especially in a, in this book, that there is a very strong normative approach, which is going which needs, it's, it's uh, necessary, um, it needs to change the way not only we produce but also the way we interact with each other. It, it, it really penetrates in your own private sphere as an individual and that for me is very, very scary. And another aspect, and I would like to ask, because you, you have just mentioned that there are differences between what is uh, written here and uh, what's um, um, your, your, your work um, has been based on. But um, this guy makes very clear that for him, uh, equality goes before freedom. And uh, you know, we, we all grew up in, a, in another context. And I don't know how many people would ever be willing to give up this freedom. We know it is a very basic right we have. And a second concern is more about Okay, so commons, um, on a local level, they will al allow you and help you to gain independence from market transactions because there will be a more sustainable and local-based um, economy or system of exchange, you name it. But what uh, scares me a little bit is that of course, capitalism uh, needs this international trade system, of course. But uh, this, this, um, this system we live in is also based on international interactions. So what I'm, I'm worried about is that if we start basing our economy and our production only on local and community-based system, are we going to reduce our spheres of, of interaction with other parts of the world, because it is also another consequence of capitalism, globalization, but I think it's very nice. I think it's very nice that there are so many people in for this whom? place. For whom is it very nice? For us, for our own personal uh, growth. I mean... Who is we? All our individuals together, I believe. I mean... Maybe if it wasn't because of all this system, there wouldn't be an Indian guy sitting next to me and a Russian girl on the back. And because probably we would have just limited means which will help us maybe to live a better life, but on a local level. So, um, yeah, bec and also another aspect, but this is very confused, so I apologize in advance, is all this system of uh, sustainable uh, production, local, it will somehow, 
um, demonetize the way we e interact economically with each other, but wouldn't also this prevent us to have some sort of freedom to decide what we want to have? And it will only be based on what we, what is available around us, and it's very limited. And probably this is the way, the reason why the very first international trades began, like the Silk Road. Then obviously there was a, a degeneration, but we have always had this tendency of being curious and wanting things which were far from us. And probably this is also how the exchange mechanism was created using money as a some sort of commonly agreed tool to okay I have some some inputs for you thanks will we end at eight or what is what was the plan okay <laughs> can i yeah, maybe you don't have to answer you can come to the party <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I, I already asked. I, okay. I, I, I Who? This is equality. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is Fatima, and my question is connected with Erika. Also, where are you from? Uh, Ecuador. Ecuador. Yes, and and well, in Ecuador we have. What a is your name for comments on your sheet? Uh, by the, by the way, don't forget your. Names, your words. I oh. Comunes. Comunes. Yes, and well, uh, in Ecuador we have the uh, the new project that is uh, the economy based on commons. That is follows uh, the idea of buen vivir and the also... The economy of? Uh, I just didn't the economy based on commons. Ah, yeah, the commons based economy. On commons. Yeah. So, uh, the flock project. Yes, and yeah. the government is taking this uh, as very serious project. It uh, has changed the national plan of uh, the society, and we are uh, every four years it changed uh, according to the new necessities of the country. And now we have a flock society that uh, people are collaborating in some research uh, in order yeah. to change the policies of the country. So. Uh, in this aspect, so what is your perspective about to have a, a real country, a, a, a country which take this economy based on commons? Because it seems like a good idea at the first moment, but there are some critics from, from the people who live in, in the country who say that it's an utopia idea and they don't want to collaborate with that. But uh, in, in your case, a uh, researcher of commons and also with the experience that we have from Michael Bowens that also works in, in Ecuador. So maybe you are uh, more, uh, you know more about this, if this is possible or not. Thank you. You ask later. Ah, okay, okay, I thought that was... <laughs> Sorry. What would be the incentives for not being a commoner? No, I really wonder. I mean, what would be what would be an incentive for not being a commoner? I don't need much money. Yeah, yeah. 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 power. I don't want to grow my own food. I, I, I just want. I want someone else. Ah, well, well, ah, okay, okay, okay. So you think that if you are a commoner, you need to grow your own food? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> what else? <laughs> 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 He's financially. <laughs> 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 okay. Okay. No. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, no. That's good. Um. <laughs> Yeah. You can do it whatever you like or you put that and then exchange it for. Uh, yeah. She got it. Yeah, not to hijack the question. Korea, you know. Korea. Yeah, no, I'm not hijacking the question. I want it. I know. I think. I. Ah. 
Ah, uh, yeah, you, yeah, you were hijacking his question. Oh, okay, so let's, let's, so we, we restart the question. What would be a reason, what would be a reason for not being a commoner? So you raised the power question. You raised an assumption, uh, a fear, that I need to grow my own food. There was another one. Money. Ah, I want to have money. Why would you like to have money? You want to live the life that you want to buy things, you want to receive, you want to need the capitalism way of life. You want to, that, that's a very good point. Because you want to live the way you are used to live. And this is extremely human. This is the, the, this is the kind of, how to say, the, the basic form of institution is habit. So we institutionalize through the way we interact each day. That is why it is so crucial, the focus when we talk about common, commons on commoning and not on the commons definition. So the very question is how to become a commoner and not what is a commons. Because it's all about, how to say that, hacking our habits, starting to think about what we just had, uh, we just heard that, but who pays rules? No switch the idea and try out another thing and then you will come up with the most important incentive for being a commoner. It simply feels better. The patterns of commoning like having daylight from two sides, having colors in the room, having the tables put not that way but in a circle, the 99% let, let aside uh, your professor will come in here and say it feels better. And that would be the most, if it doesn't feel better, if the comments doesn't feel better, it's not good enough, point. But why would make you someone who wants to, to experiment in a common? Yeah, that is what I said, yeah. That is what I, that is what I said at the beginning. Don't ask me for the motivations. The most, the biggest motivation I fear will be there is simply crisis. The biggest, the biggest motivation we have is just simply capitalism doesn't work for, and this is an answer to, to one of her questions, is when I ask you, who is the we? I know how many people applied to this course. I know how many people don't have access to education. I have been living in El Salvador, which is the capital is 30 kilometers away from the beach. And the people who have been with us have never, ever been on the beach in their lifetime. Etc. 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 So I mean that basic assumption that what we have fulfills needs, deals with the necessities of both people and nature, is is a false assumption. So um, that's like where was I? Um, yeah, that's like from the starting point, like asking asking that question not as if what we have right now would solve the problems we need to solve with the commons or through a commons approach. It doesn't solve these problems. It is inherently exclusive in splitting people in those who have and those who and the, and the haves and the have-nots. And this is a, is a problem. If you don't start from that problem, so you are not kind of worried with the equity problem, you probably go for the money, the power and whatever. But then it's not a political debate. And here is another thing. Who raised the question about equality? Yeah. He, exactly. And, and you raised a very, he raised a very, very important point. Well, first of all, research shows that um, in countries like Sweden, etc., where people are more equal, you, you certainly all know um, the level of um, satisfaction and happiness is higher than in other countries, than in c completely unegalitarian countries. So that, that, is, that is everything we know. The level of suicide is also very high. Yeah, I don't know if, if, it, <laughs> if it's correlated, exactly. They're happier, but not happier than Bhutan. Yeah, not happier, but then Bhutan. Exactly, so the disconnection of 
happiness with the level of income and the connection of happiness with the level of the, the Gini coefficient, yeah? the level of disequality, the degree of disequality is something we can start off, I think, because it has been shown again and again and again based on a certain level of dignity. So like the people in Bhutan, they have food, they have shelter, they have community. Um, so if this is true, there is one thing in the comments which I think is, is very different from, from this approach and from kind of more traditional socialist approach or more traditional communist approach or whatever, which is precisely that claim that we need to connect the three core ideas of different ideological streams, which is sustainability, equality and freedom in one concept. So if, if you start playing, can we say this in English, Ausspielen gegeneinander? Can we say that? Okay, if we start playing sustain <laughs> sustainability against freedom, so ranking one higher than the other, or sustainability against freedom, so ranking one higher than the other, we are already lost, I think. So for me, the very promise of the commons is that it has, that it tries to capture the idea of freedom, equality, and sustainabil sustainability <coughs> in one, but not the freedom others might mean, but freedom as a relational concept. He said that he didn't get the, the, relation, the relational thing that from I. You are, you are always, you cannot conceive the idea of freedom as being an isolated human being because simply you are not, or as, as Rosa Luxemburg said, yeah, that, that my freedom is always the freedom of the other. My freedom reconstructs and I gain my freedom through the freedom of the other. So it is a relational concept. So what feminists or we are trying to speak about is freedom in connectedness. It's like I was a little bit, when I said, who's we? Basically, I was trying to say, you know, are, are you aware of your privilege? Is this a, the we we want to construct? The we of us in here privileged and the others out there who cannot even go to the beach, even if it's only 30 kilometers away from their home. Is that a concept of freedom we really want to defend? You know, I, I, I mean, I, I don't have the answer. I'm just kind of, no, that's not the end of the story. But yes, we need to connect freedom, equality, and sustainability in the concept. And not say this one is more important and not being normative. I guess during the whole talk, you did not listen one time. This is good and this is bad. You need to be a good guy, a commoner, and the capitalists are bad guys. Many of these people out there who are reproducing this old stuff are doing it just for being unaware, habit, having been trained to, having been told to, no having other option, uh, da, 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 da. there are plenty of reasons. It's, it's not about uh, we said the no, no, we know how to do the better world and, and, and we need to educate people to be better people. Equality, freedom, demonetize. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess this also Yeah, just one last idea on it penetrates our own private space. Um, when I said that it's all about, not all, but the most important challenge we find in um, getting across with the common message is the mental barrier, the mental challenge, the mental infrastructures. So in fact, I think that in capitalism, so to say, we don't even realize how much capitalism invades our most private and intimate spaces. The way I was I raised in East Germany has been so different from the way my daughter raises right now. She finds things novel. I think, how, how did you even come up with that idea to well, I can give you very <laughs> concrete, even intimate examples. It must be like this because others do it. So I need to buy that product because it's good for. Ba, 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 ba. It's endless. 
So the most important challenge is the mental infrastructures and the, the mindset of, so to say, the systematic exclusionary capitalist framework invaded our most private spheres. And from there on, we can kind of rediscuss what is private, public and common. And one more lesson from the com from yeah. more lesson learned from the commons, and there, are, well, I mean, no state has even existed as long as common systems. States have been what? Not more than two hundred years old. <coughs> Co there are commons who have nine hundred years. <coughs> and one of the lessons learned is that a commons will only work if you have your protected private space. It's not about we share everything, we are one. It is about I am through you. And I develop my individualism through being connected to others. And this is fight, conflict resolution, hard work, da, 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 da. it's not easy. It's just like having a wonderful relationship or not. It's like we need to do it, there's no other way. Oh, good. You're really squeezing, kind of, a lot of energy. Ah, yeah, the flock society. Oh, yeah, sorry, 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 the flock society. I guess I did, didn't want to meddle with the fear of my dear colleague, Michelle Bowen. You, you know what I was really puzzled with? I was really puzzled with, with in the Ecuadorian case, how can a government start to support such a project and at the same time allow drilling in Yasuni National Park, for instance? So how can you disconnect? The, uh, that is precisely what happened there, is they've put the freedom and the knowledge commons, etc., etc., higher ranked than the sustainability issue. This is and this is, I think, one of the reasons why people in Ecuador fight it and don't agree with that approach. One of the reasons, especially the indigenous people. And the other, and the other reason is obviously the way the government, the new government, social movements has helped to come into government are now, so to say, betrayed and criminalized by, by the same government. So I think it has not been a bottom-up construction and this is a problem. Uh, but I also think that the more we have of this kind, the more we have of kind of <laughs> systematic research and how you can rethink a whole policy space on different areas from a commons perspective, the more we can draw upon. I mean, what has it been? It has just been a six months effort. This is close to nothing. And I, yeah, there was another thing I wanted to say. What we are talking about here is about a paradigm shift. What is a paradigm shift? Change of thinking, what does it mean? For, give, give me an example in history of a paradigm shift. Democracy. 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 From feudalism to capitalism. Ah, and socio-economic systems, yeah, exactly. How long does it take? I would say five generations, I would say six, 100 to 150 years. Look at the natural sciences. I mean, there's, oh, police, um, the centric worldview, heliocentric worldview, and the other one? I mean, it's like getting rid of the way the church looks at the world, and that is getting rid of the power of the church in that very time, and it took many people burned. Yeah, but I mean, that, that, that <laughs> <laughs> I mean that's what we are talking about. That's what we are talking about. That's why I said the commons. If 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 we uh, if we talk about who who is controlling, who is ruling the world, it's about life and death. It's nothing else. And in, in, in Latin America, I mean, that's what we see every time, right? So um, yes, we are talking in 150 years horizon. So I would say, but we are. We have already gone the first 30%, 35%, because that paradigm shift started uh, when um, um, Einstein discovered the 
real uh -huh. relativity. It is all about you cannot assume in natural sciences sciences that there is such a thing as a thing. And that's what he showed. And since that, natural sciences need to deal with that. And I couldn't come up with really changing the framework. And we were living in the world where the social sciences took over the natural sciences framework. And now we are starting to get rid of it 50 years after, 60 years after. But it's all there. It's in biology, the paradigm shift is going on. In physics, the paradigm shift is going on in social sciences. And in politics, it's not a paradigm shift. It's just struggle out there in the streets. So yeah, so we are not halfway done, but now it depends on if it will be very bloody or not. I have a yes. uh, okay, I am Floriana. Um, my definition, uh, the definition that I uh, knew about commons is that they're neither private, uh, they cannot be connected to neither private uh, um, property and public pro property, okay. and especially Italian theorists like, uh, I don't know, Ugo Mattei, Stefano Rodotà. Uh, ah, they you're Italian? Yes. <laughs> they especially um, connect uh, the concept of commons to the ones of democracy, in which um, commons actually enhance participation from the of the of the communities, so it really enhances a bottom-up uh, democracy and participation. Uh, but also following, uh, especially Professor Scoriat class on commons, um, I was wondering: isn't there a risk to have um, a dis like a fragmented uh, fragmented uh, framework in which we have uh, a series of different autonomous communities? Uh, of course, each one uh, caring about their own interests, about their own communities, and common good. Uh, but I isn't there a risk of uh, having um, such a fragmented framework, disintegrated framework? Uh, and uh, is this a uh, necessary evil or is it uh, okay? What uh, is your opinion on this? Excellent. If I would... Ah, there was another last one. Yeah, okay. two more questions. Yeah, two more. Okay. Hi, so I have all kinds of things. Um, so one of the things you'd said when you were sort of drawing the web up there was that you find that people can't imagine it or they, it's hard to like put yourself in it. And I would definitely say I can't imagine it. Um, I, I sort of, but as I sort of said in the presentation, a week ago I had no idea what the commons were. So this, uh, this has sort of been zero to 60 in learning what all of this stuff is. Um, so, so I really don't know, like if I were to want to be a commoner, start commoning, do I have to drop out of school? Do I grow my own food? Where do I have to go to do this? Do I have, no, I mean, that's what I'm imagining. That, that's okay. what this looks like to me. And, and I don't know if that's necessarily what it yeah. is. Okay. And, and so I guess something that, I think you're totally right to, to point on power and the privilege relation of all this. Um, because I, I, I like my life and there's a lot of things about it that are very nice and I don't want to give those things up. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I can see how this commons relation could be very good for have-nots, but I don't know how you would convince haves to join in. And I, I guess I don't know if that's important or if this is intended to be an alternate form of social and economic organization for have-nots. Um, and, and so that's sort of, it, it's, it's difficult, and I guess just kind of jumping at the end of Floriana's point as far as for someone trying to learn everything I could about this in seven days, you get a lot of very, very different things when you look up commons as far as... It, what it, she said, yeah. It, it's sort of hard as an outsider Absolutely. to really know what's going on, and so I, I wonder if you could just contextualize a little bit for us for yeah. who aren't in that world, what, what is out there and how do different people talk yeah. about this? very good, yeah. And I don't know if it's, if you sh I, I will ask a question, but um, I, I won't uh, develop on the failures of capitalism, the failure of socialism as state-led economy, and the idea of having or finding a third concept, which could be commons, in order to put inside the same pot, as you say, the, the issue of freedom, sustainability, also effectiveness in the economy in a way, is interesting. I, I, Probably uh, mentality can change in 200 years, probably. Uh, it will take a long time, but I, I do not only, I mean, 
it's not my, my, my point of view is that, that commons are not interesting if and only if mentality are changing. It's also a, a matter of effectiveness. And mm -hmm. the thing that uh, you, you did not talk about is, is the issue of effectiveness, in a way. Mm -hmm. uh, we saw, like, Wikip we, Wikipedia is a very good example, and, and, and free software, open source software are, mm -hmm. are really good examples. Mm -hmm. But the thing that has surprised me, in a way, not a long time ago, reading, for instance, a book from, uh, by uh, Michel Bowens, is that it can also concern material goods. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Last year, for instance, the first joint seminar was on 3D printing. Okay, one of the one of the of your professor told me we could do something about 3D printing. I said, okay, why not? But I okay, I, and I realized that 3D printing connected to the issue of intellectual property and to all the issue of commons could have a, an important, could lead to important changes in trading issues, in the way we organize development, in the way we organize the economy. I mean, in the long term, it can be a, a, a very big revolution, not, not only 3D printing, but commons can, uh, can deal with non-material and material goods in a way that, okay, we can't just imagine in a way that is very effective. There is an example in the book of Michel Bowens about the, the creation of a car prototype, mm -hmm. which is really, really amazing. Mm -hmm. Okay, where a small team cre creates, a, okay, nobody knows each other, and in, in six months they create a prototype that can compete with prototypes made by the industry in many years. Mm -hmm. Okay, taking so I even the the, uh, the the duration of the processes in the commons uh, sector, uh, in, in a way, are very different and can be much more efficient than in in the, the traditional economy. So I, I I I get to my question, which is. Uh, I, I, I realize that the economy, okay, many sectors can be, can, okay, commons have, can have a very huge impact on many sectors. But I was wondering, discussing with Lena, uh, whether uh, we can imagine uh, social protection, for instance, as a commons, health insurance and all that stuff. <laughs> which, means, which means not led by the state. I, in that case, I mean, so. are you realizing that what's happening here is precisely what I was saying the whole time? Talking about the commons is talking about everything. It's like, well, I, I, started, I started being interested in the commons when, in 2004, I discovered that yeah. what happens everywhere is enclosure. That kind of putting the fences and putting the top-down control, etc. For different, and for simply power reasons or economic reasons, political reasons, whatever. And that the very same thing happens to the soil, enclosure, enclosure and erosion, to the water, but also to software. There was a so was, um, free software activist from Argentina in 2006 at a conference we had. It was the first international commons conference we organized. And I, I've been <coughs> working in, in Mexico City by the time. And and uh, there was an Argentinian activist, and she was invited to a group, a bunch of people, farmers and water activists, and said, what the hell am I doing here? I'm working on software-related issues. And at the end of the three days, she was <laughs> about to present. She was asked to present, and she opened the computer, and she, all of a sudden, she got it. She got it as the very same thing. She opened their computer and put the first question on the slide. It was, whom does your computer work for? And then she was like, your computer, for instance, seems to work for Apple, right? So, and then she was explaining us how enclosure works in all these sectors. And, and so my first interest was understanding the process of enclosure and through this, trying to connect activists from different fields to make them see that it's about everything. And the more I go into it, I realized it's about everything. And you are right, you can produce cars in a peer-to-peer -peer style like Wikispeed. And recently, this, this very question where, especially in Middle Europe, we are so used to think of um, the health sector as a public sector. 
That is not, I mean, that's not common everywhere, but that, that, was, that was the political fight throughout decades in Latin, Latin America, the fight for the state, the fight for the public sector, the fight for good provisioning, etc. until understanding that this very state depends on an economic system that is precisely at the very same, same time succubating the basis of that very state and the effects we see them right now, which is the austerity politics. So understanding that this is tied to the very same economic system and depends on the very same economic system and you cannot, it's, it's kind of hard to see how you will defend the public system as long as you rely on an economic system which is undermining the very public system. It kind of doesn't make sense to me. So you need to think about this connection. Redesigning a public sector that does not rely on the market, but this rely on the commons. I mean, how, why is it that we are so used to speak about public-private partnerships and not about public-commons partnerships? Just, an, just to give an example. And it is surprising to me because why did I not talk about efficiency in the, the way you've put it? Because I'm not the expert on these issues. I don't look at the figures. Um, I would tell what I look at, I found this a very important question of where do I speak from and or what is our role in this whole um, frag partly fragmented debate. Um, is I find these are very useful examples, etc., etc. For me, they are not the decisive ones because it's not about producing more race cars like Wikispeed does. It's about changing the paradigm. It's about changing culture, it's about changing habits. And one thing doesn't exclude the other. So we can use all of these examples and contribute to a, a huge commons debate. So is there a risk of fragmentation? Yes. <coughs> but for one very, mm, this is not a risk in terms of, mm, there is a colleague from France here, Frédéric Sultan, and he says, um, we need to think about a commons definition or an approach to a commons as a commons process. So the very definition of the commons is a commoning process. You get me? So this is the good thing, and I think it cannot be differently. I, I, ca I cannot. That, that what, what Christian Felbert does is he says what the economy for the common good is, right? And the, he then further develops it, and he puts it in the book with his name on it, and only with his name on it. And he has done tenth book from the same style. I would never do this. I would never write a book and say, this is the Gehelfrich's definition of the commons. I think this is just nonsense. That's not the way the commons should be talked about. Um, and so there, this is the good part of it. Where's the bad part of it? Off the record. The bad part of it that especially scholars have more power than we have and they get more funding than we do and that there is not an equal, hmm, how to say this? Yeah, it's not a peer-to-peer -peer relationship. And yeah, we sometimes feel sad about it. So where um, are we in this fragmented world of commons definitions? And there, I, I would say that there are, and, and you might correct me because you know our work from outside, um, I would say that there are only a few people in the world who look at the commons, at all types of commons. We look at all types of commons. And we look at all types of commons in, in the world. And we are kind of bridge builders and moderators of a, a commons debate um, wherever people wish to have it, so to say. So we bridge scholarship with uh, activism, we bridge uh, the commons work in Latin America with the one in, 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 in Asia, we bridge languages, for instance, I translate commons literature from five languages into German and then back to English and whatever. So it's like, I, I think we are kind of bridge builders and there are only few of us who really have like David Bollier, Michelle Bowens and I, and perhaps Charlotte Hess, who kind of have a bird's eye views on the issue while trying to develop the own or move forward in deepening the, the conceptual issues. Um, and that is why you can find in our books that the more traditional Marxist perspective and the very liberal peer-to-peer -peer communist 
I mean, put it, we, we try to make sense out of it. We put them in one book and say, hey, even those guys, those coming from business making it, those coming from a Marxist tradition, there are common patterns. They're, they have something in common and we need to learn to see that we, all of us are co-constructing another paradigm. If this is not true, well, yeah, then we are, then history will tell. Did I leave something out? Something important? Wait, let me, let me. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah, 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 that, is, that was really important. I like that one. I really don't know if I want to be a communist. How will I know? There was one person who said what I really want to like. Mm. We said, in the, during the talk, I said, each commons is one of a kind, right? And the very different to, for instance, the traditional commons are uh, a, a commons you raised in because uh, you were born in a community and have no way out there, etc. is that um, obviously under the new conditions, new conditions means a new energy basis, a new communication basis, etc. So the commons is a very old concept, but it has never been thought of, or it, had, it has never been reproduced under the conditions we currently have as a society. And if, if Jeremy Rifkin is right, Jeremy Rifkin says that if the energetic basis of a society switches, so now from fossil fuels to renewables, and the communication technology switches, like you remember book printing? Everything changed. And now the digital area, everything changed. It penetrated our daily lives. And he says, if the both things switches, you are, mm, you, you have, so to, so to say, a window of opportunities to develop a no, new societal framework. That's what usually happens in history. And so we have that new opportunity and Based on these new conditions, we need to rethink a very old concept. Because, of course, now what you can do is, you can choose your own comments, that's what I want to say. So what do you really like to do? Try out to do it in the old-fashioned way, so go to the next shop and buy it. Or go to, I don't know, a repair cafe and produce it with other people, whatever. I mean, what do you really, really want to do? Try it out, and if it feels good, you might have one more element to decide to become communal or not. Doing. It's just doing. Okay.